Now, I personally have been looking forward to our next speaker, David Heathfield, for quite some time because I really think I think storytelling is such a powerful way to learn all sorts of things, something I've done with my own children a lot. Um, and so I'm just really excited to see, to see this one. Um, David today is sponsored by Ellie and Delta Publishing, and David spins tales and trains teachers in storytelling all over the world and online. And he is the author of Storytelling with Our Students and Spontaneous Speaking, Drama Activities for Confidence and Fluency, which are both published by Delta. And today, David is going to talk to us about live, creative, and interactive storytelling online. So David, I'm going to mute myself and turn this over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. It's a lovely introduction. Um, can you hear me okay? Great. Okay. Well, let me know if you can't. Um, I'm David Heathfield. I'd like to thank uh, Sarah and Sonia from International House for arranging for me to be here. I'd like to thank Delta Publishing, who've published uh, both of the books that I've written. And um, yeah, let's Let's get started. And could you just write in the chat, what colour are you wearing today? Because I can't see you. But if you tell me what colour you're wearing, don't have to tell me what you're wearing, but what colour you're wearing or the main colour you're wearing, that could come in useful for the story that we're going to feature in this session. Um, there is a handout and also the slides will be shared. So Sarah Stats is going to manage that part of it. Uh, that you could get those at the end of the talk or after the talk. So live, creative, interactive online storytelling in English, how teachers can tell stories to engage young learners. So I'm imagining that most of you are teaching young learners. So let's say from preschool right through to maybe 11, 12 years old. Some of you in private uh, schools in Milan and in Italy or other parts of the world. Many of you working in state education. And storytelling, as we all know, is the most ancient way of passing on knowledge, the ancient way of education. It's not just a 21st century skill. It's always been a skill for tens and thousands of years of humanity. But there have been changes afoot. So we can look at the, the, the picture you can see there on the first slide showing the traditional image of the storytelling or the storytelling around the fire, the community coming together, learning from the elder, learning from each other, learning together, call and response, interactive. But I found, that, and I, I associate myself with that form of storytelling. I tell traditional folk tales, but more and more, as you can see in the other picture, it's going online and certainly not by choice of mine, but I've done all, nearly all of my storytelling since March, or all except one experience has been by the internet where sometimes I can see the people I'm telling the story with, or like now sometimes where I can't over Facebook Live, for example, I often do storytelling, as in the example here, where I cannot see this girl who's in Palestine with the Hands Up Project le learning a story with me, but nevertheless, I can communicate with her through the chat and we can still do interactive storytelling, as I'll demonstrate here. And I know that like in the UK, in Italy, you're going through all sorts of changes from week to week, where sometimes it's, it's online, sometimes it's face to face, uh, maybe going back online again, and how we can manage that difficult situation. But we can still do the storytelling that we as primary teachers love to do interactively with our students. And hopefully I can demonstrate that with you today. So it's a global phenomenon. We bring the world together through stories and Recently, we're able to tell stories across great distances and be simultaneously together with people and children in other parts of the world. More about that later. Uh, this is a book that I wrote, Storytelling with Our Students, from Delta Publishing. Um, it's the second book I wrote with them. The first is Spontaneous Speaking, Drama Activities for Confidence and Fluency. This book is all about developing Storytelling with our students, techniques for telling tales from around the world is all about developing as a classroom storyteller. And more and more, the, I'm realizing that what I wrote about for the physical classroom can easily be transferred in most cases 
to the online classroom, to the virtual classroom like we're in right now. And I just want to quickly explain what I mean by storytelling and it includes personal storytelling. But in this session, I'm particularly looking at um, oral storytelling, the traditional folk tales, fairy tales, mythology, the storytelling that's been passed down from generation to generation. We don't know who authored the story. It's been honed by all the tellers that have told it over the years. And we're talking about telling a story that we know or a story that we've learned and a story that's meaningful to us, a story that we can tell without a text. So, of course, all of us do storytelling with books where we read aloud to our students or they read. And that's really valuable. But I want to talk about the power and the value of telling stories where we're not working with a fixed text, where we can tell a story heart to heart, face to face, and use our bodies and hands and faces and emotions and the energy in the room to create an exciting interactive experience. And as Mario Rinvalucri uh, wrote, and he's perhaps my number one teacher when it comes to creative learning in the classroom or outside the classroom as well for that matter, he says, if a teacher reads the story from a book, the page is often between her and the students. When she tells, she's a fountain and the words of the story gush forth from her. She, the teacher and the story are one as the water is with the fountain. So when we have learned a story and then we tell it, and I don't know whether you already tell stories, maybe you do tell stories that you love, perhaps in Italian, perhaps in English, perhaps in a combination. But I'm advocating starting with those stories, starting with stories that may be familiar to children, whether it's Little Red Riding Hood, The Three Little Pigs, Goldilocks, but telling them and then moving on to telling them new stories. Stories that they might already know in their mother tongue, that they might already know from learning Italian and then retelling those stories in English, but maybe not only depending on pictures and words, but telling it using our storytelling skills. Nick Bilbra, you can see him on the right, is the founder of the Hands Up Project, which supports children and teachers in Palestine and beyond Palestine, a lot in Gaza, uh, the Gaza Strip in Palestine who finding a voice to, to express themselves creatively and make contact with people beyond those borders, beyond those uh, uh, gates. And he wrote a book called Stories Alive um, for the British Council, a wonderful book with lots of resources. And it's written for the Palestinian context, but I would say it's a wonderful book where to introduce uh, storytelling to your learners in and around Milan or all over Italy and everywhere. Lots of wonderful ideas. And Nick writes in that book, there are many advantages in putting storytelling at the center of what we do and in organizing our teaching around it. So not just as a part of our learning, but at the heart of our learning. And particularly when we're working with young learners, it's so appropriate to put storytelling right there at the heart. Now, I talked earlier about changes with technology and this man, Adrian Underhill, did a session earlier this year, the first IATEFL International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language conference to go online because the annual face-to-face -face conference, conference couldn't happen because of lockdown, because of restrictions and pandemic. So we had a, a, a get together, an international get together. And in that uh, get together, Adrian Underhill asked this question, could online teaching provide an affective game changer that unhooks us from our noisy classroom omnipresence to talking across the kitchen table? And I, I loved what he talked about because a lot of us, storyteller teachers have talked about the difficulties of not being in the same space. How can we 
carry on doing this kind of personal, creative, face-to-face -face interaction when we're on a screen. But he asked us to look at it in a different way. Adrian said, well, let's say we're in a noisy classroom a lot of the time. What can we do through a screen that we can't do in a classroom? And we can have a certain intimacy where we can lean into the camera and we can be talking to a lot of people, as I am now, but perhaps it feels like we're just talking across the kitchen table. I'm sitting at a table and perhaps you are as well, or maybe you're sitting on the sofa, but we're talking quite intimately. And I don't need to use my big storytelling projection voice to uh, hopefully to uh, engage you. And we can do things through the, the chat, which we might not be able to do face to face. So we're looking at what's possible. So what I'm going to demonstrate in this session and in the workshop is how we can do storytelling as is familiar to us as primary teaching practitioners. We can still do it. We can do it successfully and in slightly different ways using the computer. So there we are. How are we going to do it with our learners? And some of the most fundamental techniques in storytelling that we can use uh, for young learners in particular, but I use this with adults and teenagers as well, but let's say in particular with young learners are these four uh, aspects, repetition, rhythm, rhyme, and action. And I was going to say those again, repetition, rhythm, rhyme and action. So I'm going to tell you a story. We're going to do a, a part of a, a, a lesson that we might do with young learners. And after we've done it, we'll come back to these four aspects, repetition, rhyme, ry rhythm, rhyme and action, and just talk about how these work both face to face in person teaching and online and how effective they are for our young learners of English. Okay, so I'm going to stop the share now and become big and I'm just going to invite those wonderful people who said they're happy to be visible on screen to switch on your cameras if you don't mind. I'm just going to look at the chat to see what you're wearing. So we've got purple, blue, black, pink, navy. It's a wonderful colourful array of people who are, who are tuning in. Um, white okay lots of colors wonderful and could you also everybody hello people who are visible and hello everybody who's not visible uh, can i ask you to also just write in the chat um a friend is a friend is and could you just finish that phrase and you can think about this in a dual way are you yourself? But also think about what you would say as yourself when you are, let's say, eight years old. OK, so yourself at eight years old. What is a friend? So could you write a friend is. Blah, blah, blah. Just write a phrase, whatever comes into your head, just write it there in the. Um, in the chat. A friend is a gift, beautiful. A friend is fun. A friend is a listener. A friend is a blessing. A friend is someone who depends, who defends me. Everybody can write your ideas. Keep those ideas coming in. But when I start telling the story, I would invite you to stop writing and then tune in to the story. Now, I'm going to stand up because this is a physical story and if you want to, people with your cameras off and with your cameras on, so all of you, if it's comfortable for you, get out of your chair and uh, let's lift up our camera and our computer if we can and just have space to move and get ready to work with our young learners because we don't have to be sitting down when we're online. We don't have to be in a Zoom meeting sitting with this this uh, head and shoulders, we can use the space as well. I'm actually even going to take off my jacket because I'm getting ready for some physical storytelling. 
So uh, I'm going to introduce some vocabulary. First of all, where do I go to get some water? So I'm thinking most of my students don't know this word, but maybe there's one student in my class who knows this word. So could you just write it in the chat? Where do I go to get some water? And we're maybe living a long time ago or in another part of the world. Oh, thank you. Can everybody say after me? You're muted, but that's fine. Stay muted. Could everybody repeat? Because we, it's sometimes better to do repetition when we're muted, because sometimes all the voices come back at different times. And when we're muted, you can express yourself because only your family can hear you. So could you say the well? That's right. We get water from the well. Now we go into the well to get the water. Wonderful. And this story comes from Haiti. Well, I'm in England here, and most of you may be in Italy here, but if I go across the ocean, I come to Haiti here. So this is a Haitian, a Haitian folk tale, and it's called Tipingi. Can you say Tipingi? That's right, everybody, say it again. Tipingi, and can you say after me? I'm Tipingi. And can you point to yourself? I'm Tipingi. She's Tipingi. We're Tipingi too. Okay, everybody with your cameras off or on, could you all say it with me and we're gonna get faster and faster and faster. Okay, say it slowly. I'm Tipingi, she's Tipingi, we're Tipingi too. 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 Wonderful. Thank you. Now let's tell the story. Once upon a time, there was a girl called Tipingi. Tipingi lived with her mother, but her mother was not a good mother. Her mother was not a kind mother. Tipingi work, Tipingi clean, Tipingi brush the floor, Tipingi cook the food, Tipingi. Tipingi was always busy. One day, Tipingi's mother said, Tipingi, get some wood, get some firewood. Now, could one of the teachers I can see tell me, how do you say firewood in Italian? Maybe one of my students knows how to say firewood in Italian. Can you say? Unmute yourself. Can you unmute yourself? Legno, legno da, da cendere. Simona. Thank you very much. Yes. E and and can everybody say it now? Legno. Legno, that's right. Okay. So, I need some firewood, some legno, some firewood, Tipingi. Come to the wood. But Tipingi was not there. Where is Tipingi? Oh, Tipingi's mother said, I have to get the firewood myself. So Tipingi's mother, she went to the forest to get the firewood. She got some wood. She got some more. She got some more wood. Hmm. I'll get some more. Uh, Simona, have you got some wood? Could you give me some wood? Oh, thank you. And Elena, would you give me some more? Thank you for more firewood. And Ines, please. Now I have enough wood. It's too much for me to carry. Oh, I wish somebody would help me carry the wood. 
then I would give them something good. At that moment, out of the forest came an old man. He was very strange. Oh, I will help you carry the wood if you give me something good. Let's say it together. You can keep muted, but everybody listening. I will help you carry the wood if you give me something good. I will help you carry the wood if you give me something good. I will give you something good if you help me carry the wood, said Topingi's mother. So the old man picked up all of the firewood and he went with Topingi's mother all the way to her house at the edge of the village. Now give me something good. Wait, said Topingi's mother. Tomorrow I will give you my daughter, Topingi. Give her now. Tomorrow, said Topingi's mother. Tomorrow, Topingi will go to the well in the middle of the village and she will get water. Then you can take her. How will I know it's your daughter, Topingi? Tomorrow, she will be wearing red. Red clothes. Red. The next day, the old man, the strange old man, came out of the forest and into the village, he came to the well. Now, I wonder what he saw. I'll tell you. When Topingi's mother told the old man that her daughter would be wearing red. Topingi was listening. She heard her mother. Oh no, tomorrow my mother will give me to the old man of the forest. What can I do? Then Topingi had an idea. I will go to my friend. So she went to her friend, her best friend. And her best friend's name was Simona. Simona, could you unmute yourself? Hi, oh, Simona, you are such a good friend. Tomorrow, Simona, when I go to get the water from the well, please, would you help me? Please, Simona, will you wear red clothes, please? Oh, thank you, Simona. You are such a good friend. Then Topingi went to her friend, Elena. Hello, Elena, my good friend. Will you, tomorrow, will you wear red when you go to the well to get water? Of course I will. Oh, thank you, Elena. You are a true friend. You're welcome. Ines, will you wear red tomorrow? Sure. Oh, you're kind. Topingi went to every friend in the village and they all said yes. So when the old man came to the well, he saw all of the children in the village were wearing red. Which one of you is Topingi? And the children answered, you know what they said. I'm Topingi. She's Topingi. We're Topingi too, everybody. 
I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. Oh, said the old man of the forest. He went away. The next day, he came to Tipingi's mother. All of the children were wearing red. Now, give me something good. Oh, uh, tomorrow, tomorrow you can take my daughter to Pingy. Tomorrow, when she goes to the well, she will be wearing black, black clothes. <sighs> You better be right. The next day, well, you know what Topingi was doing. She was listening and she heard her mother. And again, she went to her friends. Simona, tomorrow when you go to get water from the well, will you wear? Oh, don't know. Can I ask her again? Really? Please, Simona, will you wear black clothes tomorrow? I will. Oh, thank you, Simona. And what about you, Ines? Yeah, me too. <laughs> True friend. And Elena? Yes, of course. All her friends said yes, they would wear black. So when the old man came the next day, all of the children were wearing black. Oh, which one of you is Tipingi? Everybody get ready. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. The old man went straight to to Pingy's mother. All of the children were wearing black. Now give me something good. T -t 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 tomorrow, tomorrow. But it was too late. I will take you into the wood. And the old man picked up to Pingy's mother and took her into the wood. Later, to Pingy came home. The house was empty. She came in through the door. Where's my mother? Oh no. Now I am all alone in the world. The old man of the forest has taken her. But at that moment, the door of the little house opened and in came her best friend, Simona. And Simona put her arms around Tipingi. And then came Elena and Ines, and they put their arms around Tipingi too. And then all of the other children came in and they put their arms around her and they said, Tipingi, don't be sad. Tipingi, we are your friends. And now we are your family. Oh, well, let's just say it one more time. <gasps> I'm to Pingy, she's to Pingy, we're to Pingy too. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, especially big round of applause for Simona, Elena and Ines. And thank you so much. Keep your cameras switched on if you don't mind, you three, but you can sit down. <laughs> of course you can. You deserve it. So um, we finished the story. Um, there's just enough time now for me to talk about what we might do after that. So follow up to storytelling, a creative response to storytelling. 
what can we do? There's so many possibilities. Perhaps there's an image in your mind, something that you imagine from the story, a single moment from the story, a powerful moment that you can see, you can hear, you can feel it in your imagination. And because there's a lot of you, rather than speak, let's just write. Could you describe one moment in the story of Tipingi that's really strong in your imagination? Everybody just write just a few words to describe a moment. I'll give you one minute and then you can click send. So describe that moment in one minute. And already we've got some coming in. Kathy says, uh, oh, Tiziana, when her friends hug her, when they all hug together, the hug at the end is significant for many. She, somebody thought she was selling out at first, trying to get her friends to be taken away by the, by the man of the strange old man. Hearing your mum giving you away. It's a very powerful moment. Hearing your mum's giving you away. Very strong moment. When the mother sells her to the man, terrible. Yeah, so there's really terrible moments and really wonderful moments. So can I ask um, those three lovely volunteer participants, could you just join me again, if you don't mind standing up? I told you you could sit down, but if you could stand up again and we could just make two of those moments. We'll do a freeze technique through the internet okay so a freeze is when we make a moment from the story but we don't move and we don't make a sound but we exaggerate with our bodies to tell the story so somebody chose the moment when tipingi is listening and she hears her mother is giving her away so you're tipingi listening behind the door can you make that moment three two one freeze and look into the camera to show us your expression. Could you make it even bigger? Because when we're doing a freeze, it's larger than life to communicate the story. So tension in the body and in the faces. Look into the camera. Three, two, one, freeze. Wonderful. And the other moment that people chose, lots of people chose, is the end. When the friends hug. So... You are Tipingi and we are hugging you. So could you be Tipingi being hugged and told that you are now part of the family? And I will be one of the huggers. So it's three, two, one and freeze. Beautiful. Thank you very much. And you can sit down now, I, I promise you. You don't have to get up again. So we can show students the key phrase to repeat before we tell the story if we want to. We could also ask them to choose a character at one moment in the story and to draw that moment and then they can guess. So, for example, here's one moment that I drew earlier and I'm not an artist. Which character and which moment do you think this shows? Would anybody like to say it or write it? Is that the mother? It's the mother. And which moment is it, Ines? When she she goes to pick up the wood. Yeah, and it's too much. It's too much, yeah. I wish someone would help me carry the wood. So we can ask children to draw a picture of a character at one moment and then guess each other's moment. There's many possible creative response tasks we could give them. They could do it in pairs, they can do it in groups, they can do it as a whole class. Okay, so let's go back now to the sharing the screen and um, we'll look at some of those. What were the four things that we were going to look at? Do you remember? Repetition, rhythm, rhyme, and action. 
repetition, rhythm, rhyme and action. Could I invite everybody in the chat just to write a couple of examples where you noticed repetition or rhythm or rhyme or action or where there's a combination of those things? Rhythm, rhyme, repetition, action. Could you just write an example in the chat? And when you've written your example, can you read other people's examples, please? Okay, so we've got the, re the repetition with <coughs> Tipingi. Okay. Wonderful. I love your spe your spelling. So I just write write down the spelling of Tipingi. There. Um, so lots of you were talking about the chant, and it was very rhythmic and full of repetition. And we also had that pointing, didn't we, for the actions? I am Tipingi, she's, it's a lovely drill, isn't it, of the, the verb to be in the present tense, or a lovely story to, to, to work with that as well. Another one Carolina's added, if you help me carry the wood, I will give you something good. Lovely. So what's the, what's the effect on learners, on young learners of using Rhythm, rhyme, repetition, and action. What's the effect for you? What, you know, what are they going to get from that? What, how are they going to benefit from that? So we've got words coming in, remembering. It makes it memorable. It makes it fluent. It's working on fluency. They're saying those words rhythmically, building up their fluency, rhythmic English. They memorize better through various channels. So it's kinesthetic. In the previous talk, Tom Kittle we talked about maybe the slightly old fashioned VAK idea, but it's there, isn't it? This visual auditory kinesthetic. Um, participation, involvement. So it makes you feel we're all in it together. We, it's not me telling you the story, but we are telling the story. And that's the, the tradition of the oral storytelling. We can do it with a book, but it's easier when we're hands-free and we're using our bodies and faces and hands. And I know that this might be a challenging issue. Lots of us haven't done storytelling without a book before, but it's something that is a wonderful skill for teachers of younger children. Not saying instead of the picture books, as well as the picture books, or to retell a story that you've done with a picture book, then put the book away and do the oral storytelling. It's so powerful. Students love it and they forgive as well. I made a mistake in that story. Did you notice? I got to the next day when the old man came out of the forest and I forgot. Oh, no, I forgot to talk about Tipingi listening and going to her friends. But maybe you didn't notice because I just went back and told that part. And it's so easy when we make a mistake to rectify it because, yeah, nobody knows what the story should be like. So you will think that's the way the story was supposed to be. <laughs> that's the beauty of storytelling. We can be playful and free within the story once we know the story sufficiently well. And I would say start with one story and then build up for there. So other things about repetition, the repetition of body movement. So it wasn't just it wasn't just the words, but the actions went together with the bodies to reinforce. So you know, TPR is in there as well total physical response. And Gillian creates empathy for characters and increases confidence. So maybe that repetition and that action helped you relate to the character, certainly helped you understand the story if you're a learner and feeling confident about understanding the story and confident saying those words together with my peers. If I understand less than them, we can share it and we can learn it together. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to screen share now And yeah, this is what we've been talking about. So in the repetition, we might have repetitions of sounds in a story, repetition of words. Um, in that story, it didn't really happen, but we could say he, she, 
um, she ran and she ran and she ran. It could be a simple repetition of a word, but it could be a phrase. Yeah. Um, if you help me carry the wood, I will give you something good. So it could be a repetition of rhymes. So repetition and rhymes often go together. It could be a repeated line of a song. It could be a repeated action. And notice also how we can use repetition, and it happens in lots of traditional stories, like the three little pigs, where we can go one, two, three. The first time we repeat after the teacher, the second time we repeat along with the teacher, the third time, or maybe the fourth time, without the teacher. Do you remember I was going, and already you were saying the words, you didn't need me to be saying it with you. So you're taking ownership and control of the storytelling. And equally with, it's very similar with rhythm. We might use rhythmic speech. I'm to pingy, she's to pingy, we're to pingy too. It's got a very strong rhythm. We might use percussion to support that. I mean, I used my shaky bean in that story, but not to use it for percussion. But we could do, we could do, I'm to pingy, she's to pingy, we're to pingy too. So that rhythm can really underpin the storytelling as well. And the episodic nature. In that version, I just did two colours, red and black. We could easily add in a third colour. And at the beginning of the session, I asked you what you're wearing today. We could choose a colour that's what one of our students is wearing or we could ask them a favourite colour. So we can include students' own ideas as well. And then we can pause between each episode. So when it gets to the old man, oh, then we're on to the next episode. The old man went to, P to Pingy's mother. And if we do it three times, by the third time, the children are helping us to tell the story. We can also do it mixed language. The first time we tell the first round, we could do it in a mix of English and Italian if, our, if we're in a monolingual class. The second round, black, we can do it in English. And maybe the third time, you know, we're doing it in English together. So we're building up that confidence with the language. So we can use mother tongue to support understanding in the first episode, or maybe the first and the second episode. And by the third episode, they're joining in totally in English, for example. Rhyming. So rhyming. Here we're telling the story that we're moving between the uh, non-scripted parts of the story, the parts that aren't fixed, to the fixed repeated refrain. So there's that switch between those two, which is common, you know, in Three Little Pigs, I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. But then it goes back to the ordinary storytelling where the teacher can, yeah, use the words that come into their mind. Rhyming is easy to join in with. And we can pause for children to supply the rhyming word or phrase. If you help me carry the wood, I will give you something. Thank you. Action, we can mime together. It will help us with comprehension. It will help children remember, all of us remember. and. It helps them to imagine physically moving through the story when we have that repetition. So did you find yourself, could you imagine to Pingy's world, to Pingy's village, to Pingy's forest? Could you imagine the well and to Pingy's house? Maybe that kind of storytelling tradition helps us to physically move through the space of the story in our imaginations. After storytelling, we can do these kinds of things get students to describe what they imagined. You started to describe a moment. We're going through it at a pace, but you've got the idea. We can ask students to make freezes of favorite moments from the story. We can ask them to role play a moment from the story. Yeah, we could have the encounter. One of us could be the old man, the other one could be Topingi. They could act out, this, or Topingi's mother, I should say. So Topingi, to bring his mother and the old man meeting. And students could use the same words that we used. We could get them to invent and add, and maybe even script it and act it out. A gift, students choose a gift for a character in the story. What gift would you like to give the mother? 
we haven't got time now, but it'd be very interesting to know your ideas. It can be very revealing what students say. If you want to, you can add your idea to the chat. What gift would you give her? It could be anything. We could create poems, songs, messages, artwork, movement, dance. These, these things take more time. We can allow more time for a creative response. The first ideas can be very quick, can be instant response. These take more time. We can invest time. And don't just tell the story once, of course, as you know, as primary teachers, students, children want to hear the story told maybe over a period of a few weeks and even work towards telling the story, which is what we're going to look at in the workshop that follows um, after this, after you've had a break. Grace Hallworth, who's the one of the patrons of the Society for Storytelling in the UK, the woman on the left, said, Storytelling is a union of heart, head and spirit, heart, head, heart and spirit and a unique expression. We should therefore allow space for an individual response from those with whom we share our understanding. So we share this knowledge, we share the experience, but we also allow children to talk about it individually. And this story, Topingi, is a story that's about resilience. You know, talk about 21st century skills, creativity and resilience. She thinks creatively to solve the problem. And, she, and it's all about, well, how can I survive? I can be self-reliant and, well, with my friends together, we're united. Um, I work with the Hands Up Project as a, as a volunteer storytelling teacher. And this is Hanin Jadala, who's a volunteer teacher within Gaza. And she talks about the power of online storytelling. And I'm just going to read this through um, before we come to the, the very end of this session. She wrote this. I believe that learning can happen at any place and at any time, irrespective of all the obstacles which are placed in their way. When learning, when children are free from the classroom walls, from rules, from marks, from pens and pencils, maybe they can travel even more easily by their imagination with the storytelling sessions far away. They live the actions of the stories in their mind, smell the aromatic scents of the scenes as if they're really with them and hear the music in their own silence to cheer their spirits in spite of all the hard times they pass through. Learning through online stories can be immensely effective for the students, maybe even more so than what happens in their regular classes. Wow. They learn how to use language functionally and how to be creative and brilliant with it at the same time. It's also about sharing and discussing values, gathering all together and feeling united, sharing cultural aspects and even creating a future generation of storytellers. Moreover, it's a kind of survival for those learners, wherever they are. It helps them to escape from being stuck at home in self-isolation to a more motivating international cultural context. What a testament, the power of storytelling to bring our children together when they're stuck at home, when they're maybe struggling, who knows what they're going through. Bringing the world together through stories. You're very welcome to join us at the Hands Up Project every day there's storytelling and it's free for you to, for your children as well to come along and participate um delta publishing published my books so thanks again to them that's my book storytelling with our students if you want to develop as a classroom storyteller it's got 40 stories in all sorts of techniques and activities that can be applied to other stories stories alive i mentioned by nick bilborough the Hands Up Project. And it just so happens that if you're interested in this topic, I have got a course. I teach freelance online courses called Creative and Engaging Storytelling for Teachers. And there's a link. I'll add it to the chat uh, just in a moment um, if you're interested. I've got a course that starts tomorrow. It's six weeks, two hours every Saturday morning. And it's, so it's a progression course where we can put what we're, what we're learning into practice um, in whatever context we're in. It's for storytelling in education broadly, but most of the participants are story teachers working with younger learners. And that's my website, uh, my email address. I always respond to emails if you've got a query. And I've got a huge YouTube channel and you can watch those stories again. So I'm just going to um, go out of the screen share. As I say, this presentation is going to be shared with you. I'm just going to, oh, it's already been added, but I'll paste it again. 
can you see what I've just pasted there? Um, you've got um, first of all a link to Tipingi. I hope. Oh no, I think it's just. Ah yes, yes. If you look where I posted, it says Tipingi from the magic orange tree and other Haitian folk tales told by. Diane Volkstein, who was a co-author of that book, and there's a video of her telling it in 1978, a really old video, but it's fantastic. And that's where I learned the story. And then there's a, a video of me telling it live with children in Hamburg in Germany. And then there's information about my course. So if there's anybody interested, you need to register this morning or, or certainly by this afternoon if you were interested. Feel free to ask me more questions.